so I'm guessing it's a uh, good afternoon for everyone that's listening or most people are listening today. So like she said, I am Jackie Castro and I will just be talking to you a little bit about treatment planning and a little bit of the considerations that go into creating a plan with dosimetry. And let me just start by saying that you can go ahead and interrupt me at any time and ask any questions that you might have, or you can wait until the end. Just let me know. So let's just go through uh, learning objectives uh, for today. First, just we're gonna go through some general principles of dosimetry and treatment planning, and then we'll just sort of highlight how simulation is actually the very first and one of the more important parts of planning. And then we'll go through a little bit of what uh, we go through whenever we select the field and modality that we're using for treatment. We'll cover the differences between forward versus inverse treatment planning. And then we'll go through extensively about contouring, constraints, what do they mean, and also some of the guidelines that we use to define these uh, contours, as well as going through the definitions of a GTV, CTV, and PTV. And then we'll briefly cover DDH. I'm pretty sure that you might have already heard about some of these terms. Please stop me if you need more information. So general dosimetry. So let's start by saying that a good plan really does start a simulation. So making sure that we have a good setup, good communication, it's the very first step that's needed for us to be able to come up with a good plan. <clears throat> because where our machine and our system can create Anything that we ask it to, if it's not a reproducible setup or if the patient cannot be on the table or if the gating isn't done correctly, then our plan will not be of good quality, even if it appears to be so on the screen. Some good things to note for our therapists is they usually give us, you know, they tell us how they set up the patient and if they didn't set it up as we would usually expect it to. They would tell us why, was it for patient comfort. They would usually note the position on the table. They would even give us vertical measurements from where they set up the patient. So usually we have BVs that are placed on the scan. They would tell us what the vertical distance to the lateral BVs are, and that's just to give us a physical reference versus what we have on the scan. And then just anything unusual about the setup. So if anything that you think uh, is worth mentioning, just go ahead and mention it. We would usually would rather have more information than not enough, okay? So once the simulation is done and we get to start choosing between the different modalities of treatment, first we have to understand sort of what these modalities are before we can select it. So there are some things that we are still doing in sort of the 2D world. So emergency treatment, if a patient comes in at night or over the weekend, we will still do emergency treatments using 2D techniques. And that's usually just a, a quick hand calculation. Parameters are usually given to the therapist by the physicist. And they will, you, you guys go ahead and usually come up with the MU calculation using those parameters that you are given. Usually this is a temporary type of treatment. It's usually just over the weekend or like I said, at night. And then the symmetry will take it over and create something a little bit more robust. But sometimes it will still be just a 2D treatment. So just keep that in mind. Therapy team doesn't do a lot of planning, but they will sometimes take care of MU calculations for emergency treatment. Another thing that we do Pretty much 2D treatment are electrons. If uh, the, the, the physician wants to draw a target at the machine, that's what we call a machine simulation. And they will draw the field at the machine. They will give us all of that information. The therapist will record all of the parameters. So what gantry angle, the location of the table, the size of the block, and then they would give us a measure, the, the picture of what the doctor drew so that we can digitize it and just send it out for printing or for creation of the block. But again, that is very much a 2D treatment. We don't have any type of scan for these uh, types of treatment. All we do is do the MU calculation and then send it back to the therapy team. And then there are special procedures, TBI, so that's the total body irradiation or TSEIs, which is the total skin irradiation. 
We will also just do 2D techniques for those as well, where it's a treatment that gets done in the same way almost every single time. All we are doing is doing calculations, so getting MUs for the treatment uh, system. Okay, and so just to illustrate, this is how the 2D technique started, where you just get a measurement from the patient. So usually you just have to get the patient separation. The calculation point will very usually be in the middle of that separation, and then you calculate MUs assuming homogeneous tissue. So in this case, you would assume uh, water density. These treatments are not extremely accurate, but usually they're palliative, and it is more important to get a fast treatment than a more accurate treatment when these cases are selected. And this is just illustration of how you would start setting a patient. And in the case of the 2D or even the clinical simulations where they're done at the machine, you would have a physician and even a physicist or other team members assisting in and verifying those fields. And then we get a little bit more into forward planning. We advance onto 3D. So usually for 3D, that means that we have to have a scan. For that, we would use our, I guess, clinical knowledge to decide what type of treatment do we need? Do we need tangents? Do we need an APPA plan? Would a conformal arc be better? And then there are the known um, I guess simple 3D uh, techniques, which is a four-field box or a three-field uh, plan for a rectum case, et cetera. During this, the selection of this plan, 3D has a varying level of complexity. We could really just have something that is in a three-dimensional setting where we're still not doing a lot of calculation. So we will just do an open field. In this case, we do have heterogeneous tissue. So at least we do have the difference between bone and muscle or air if it's in the lung area. And that gets taken into account with our calculation. But for some other 3D treatments, we actually do something, and this is very common, which is field in field which is we try to block some of the areas that are a little bit, so to speak, so that you're receiving more dose than we would want it to. So we block some of the dose in that area to cool the plant down a little bit. Then there are other techniques. Easy Fluence is a tool that um, we use at Stanford that's very quick to use, especially for breast treatment. And then there are other, something more simple, a dynamic wedge, or it could even be a physical wedge. I know that nowadays we're mostly going away from the physical wedges just because they do uh, complicate planning a little bit, but a dynamic wedge does a similar effect. And again, that would be, that would mean that we are modifying the fluence a little bit is usually not very much. And everything that we do, we are going to do manually. So that is sort of the big takeaway about forward planning uh, whenever we're doing 3D cases, even if it, it looks very complex, everything that happens during that plan, we had to do manually. So 3D cases or 3D plans are, are used for more simple treatments, but they are the gold standard for some of our treatment sites. So breast treatment, that is one of our, it, it's a, it's a, plan that gets done a lot. We, we get a lot of breast cases, but they are almost inclusively 3D as well. So those, those would be treated with tangents. And if we need a supraclavicular treatment, then we would still have just a third field just above the tangent. Another reason to use 3D would be palliative care. So a patient that just needs a quicker treatment, we're not going to as high of a dose because we're not going for cuter doses than we would go ahead and use the 3D uh, plan. And in some cases, and I know that this is maybe just to in the States, insurance approval sometimes is not as easy to get approval uh, for the insurance for IMRT. So we would have to end up um, using a 3D plan. Okay, so and these are just a, a couple of examples of what were our most common 3D plans would entail, like I said, breast tangent. This continues to be the gold standard for breast treatment. Then we have a simple APPA field. This is used a lot for 
spine treatments. It's also used for hip treatments. So we do get to treat a lot of hips that are just APPA or the spine that's APPA. If there is any lesion that is on the periphery, we would use something similar to the breast field. So we definitely go ahead and use tangents. And by tangents, I do mean parallel opposed fields. So as you can see here, we have fields that are matching each other. So we're just going to oppose them and treat in that plane. Another thing, and this is another common treatment, whenever we have to do head and neck cases, we will do lateral treatments if it's in the neck area instead of doing ATPA, but it's a similar technique. It's just we don't have to go through some of the anterior structures. And if we are not treating through, we can also stay away from the cord during those treatments. And then if sometimes we just need a little bit more conformity, so making sure that the high doses are hugging the target a little bit better, we would use multiple fields. So instead of just using two, we would use three or four fields. In this case, we're trying to avoid organs such as the liver. And for these cases, it is common to use either a combination of wedges and field and field or just wedges or just field and field. And this is a lot of the time just depending on how easy the, the defluence gets created. Some patients, you have to do a little bit more for some, for other patients like wedge, which is the quickest way to plan, will work just fine. So when, you know, that is sort of what we do with 3D planning. Then we move on to inverse planning. And inverse planning, it, it can be similar to our 3D plans. In some cases, we could even have the same selection of fields, but then we are going to allow the machine to decide where the blocking happens. So what we do is we have contours that are labeled as targets, and we let the machine which we let the machine know which contours are those, and then we also have contours for our normal tissues. And so those are going to be the organs at risk or OAR. And then we give the machine a set of instructions of what we want the doses to be. And the machine tries its best to adhere to those instructions and give us a plan that meets all of those instructions or exceeds them. So all of this, and this is even for 3D cases, we are going based off of whatever the physician prescribes, so the dose that the physician prescribes. Then we as asymmetrists, we, we know uh, certain dose limits that we have to keep for certain OARs, and then the physician will have a request on what doses to make sure that we keep off of the organs at risk as well. A lot of the times we do have to make a lot of compromises. Sometimes we have to compromise on coverage, or if that is not a possibility, we have compromised the organ at risk. And obviously not all organs at risk can be compromised. So there's always a back and forth with the physician. And that is another big part of planning is just making sure that you're in good communication with your physician. IMRT or VMAT, these are techniques that are used with inverse planning. These are the, the types of plans that we would create for patients that need something that is more conformal, something that's a lot um, more complex. And also it allows us to escalate doses. So we are not limited um, by the organs at risk. If we are using IMRT, we can do a lot more than we would, we would be able to do with a 3D plan. This is just an illustration of how we went from a 2D plan. So this is just gonna be usually an open unmodulated fluent or field. So we're just gonna have a box that is, uh, or, that is illuminated on the patient. Usually we also only have patient thickness measurement and nothing else. For 3D, we still have a scan and we are gonna try to make it a little bit more conformal by using the MLCs. These are the leaves that help us create different patterns on the machine and we will but we can still do just an open field, depending on whether or not more complexity is needed. And then we have a more conformal plan, 3D, where the fluent has been modulated. And that can be done using either field and field, a dynamic wedge, or even IMRT. So we do still use static field IMRT, where we would still select the angles that we're treating from. It can be anywhere between 5 and 
or more fields, or it could be less, but very usually for doing IMRT, we're using more than five beams to create a treatment. And then the machine decides where we're doing the modulation, but we can still modulate the beam manually issues, obviously still part of the forward planning. Okay, and so this is just an example of our 3D technique versus our IMRT technique. So you're looking here at the higher dose uh, level. So we're going from 54 gray all the way up to um, 70 gray, it looks like, which is what we're treating, or the, the doses that we're using for treatment. So you can see here where the 70 gray is covering a very large part of this patient head and neck, whereas in an IMRT treatment, we are hugging that, that contour. So this is going to be the blue contour is going to be our target. And we're hugging it a lot closer, which means that less of the normal tissue, it's receiving any high dose radiation. As you can tell here, they, we did try to carve out away from the cord because that in this type of planning, the cord is going to be our limiting structure. And our historical treatment for a head and neck case usually was limited a lot by how much dose we had already given to the cord. So then we would have to do electron patching and the like to try to get a higher dose to a target. And we would usually have to sacrifice coverage in order to make sure that we are getting those doses. And you can also see that there is a much larger hotspot. So this blue contour that you see here, blue isodose line that you see here, that is actually the 10% hotspot, which is extremely large on our 3D planning. And pretty much unexistent in our IMRT version. So what is the purpose of conformal radiotherapy? That's usually just a modality that we try to use to target tumors a little bit more accurately. And also it allows us to give a much higher dose um, to the tumor while still keeping all of our organs at risk under tolerance. Jackie, we have a question in the, in the Q&A. Yeah, go ahead. They said, when you do 3D, do you plan electron fields or just do manual calculation? Um, with, sorry, there's, okay, go ahead. I'll, I'll add more once you're. Go ahead, you can add more, it's fine. Okay, and then they said, if yes, manual, how do you take care of hotspots at the match lines? Also, is it good to do manual or plan and match electron fields if matching is needed in patients with nodal spread getting 3D treatment for head and neck? Are you able to spare parotids and how would you do that? So in short, with 3D, that is a lot harder to do. So yes, you do patch electrons manually, and that is actually the only way that we can usually get this wing. So part of the treatment technique is that you usually have lateral port coming through, treating the everything anterior to the cord to try to, I guess, again, spare the cord, make sure that we're not giving the cord too much dose. And we do have other ports, like we will have an APPA or just an AP or just a PA field treating up to 40 gray. Usually that's, again, just to make sure that we're staying under the core tolerance. Then at that point is when we start doing cone down. So we would then have just lateral ports ahead of the cord, and we would match an electron feed to catch the posterior portion of those targets. Now, cooling down the hotspot, it's extremely tricky. It can be done, but with this type of cases, especially because you're going from to different isocenters between your photon fields and your electron fields, we don't want to get too conformal or, or try to block too much because then you also risk uh, missing the target. Because if you create a cool spot and the match line is uh, not perfect every single time, then you you then run into the problem that you're going to have too cool of a spot and under treat the, the tumor. Now, parotid, those are really hard to spare using 3D technique. Usually that just means that 
we may have to compromise on coverage. You can use non coplanar beams. So that means that you're using the, the couch, the table, and you're moving that around to try to create angles that are coming from below so that you can try to get. So if you're coming in from below a little bit, you can try to search some of the product. Also, if you're doing more anterior beams or posterior beams to, again, try to create a wedge of the product that is not inside the field. But with 3D treatments, again, that is just, it's a lot harder to do. You can block it. So you can use your MLCs and use field and field to try to block it. But again, it's not the easiest thing to do. That is one of the uh, drawbacks, I guess, for 3D uh, conformal therapy. It's a lot harder to dose escalate because then we are running into the limits of the organs that are next to the target, and it's not the easiest thing to do. It's possible to, again, get lower dose, but usually to be able to completely spare it, you would have to compromise on coverage. Does that answer the question? I think so. I think that, I don't know if the, I don't know if the participants can speak. Oh, got it, got it. Okay, but yes, so that is, again, 3D conformal therapy, it's a great technique and it can be used well in many, many cases. But the reason why IMRT is becoming the gold standard for most treatment therapy, it's because we can, again, control a lot of the dose going to organs and those escalate and still be able to spare some of the organs at risk. Again, sparing the parotids is a hard task to do even with IMRT. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so for conformal therapy, there are a few things that we usually keep in mind. So we want to deliver full dose to the tumor using the most conformal coverage. And also we want to make sure that we are not hurting or injuring all of the organs at risk around the tumor. We want to be able to do one and two and preferably with a, a simple setup or as simple as possible. So for IMRT, that means using six fields instead of 20 or the like. Also, if we're using VMAT, it means using two, two arcs or one arc if possible instead of using four or five arcs. Again, all of this is just time that the patient has to be on the table. So we want to make that as simple as possible while still making sure that we're getting everything that we need out of the plan. We obviously don't want to compromise plan quality based on plant simplicity. And then another big thing is that we do want to comply with ICRU guidelines. They, they give us recommendations for how the contours should be done. And, and, and there's many other guidelines that they give us. And, and so we want to, again, make sure that we're following all of the guidelines that we have as far as those tolerances and then how the contours should be drawn and what we should be paying attention to. So for contouring, contouring is done by both the physician and the dosimetrist. So the, the physician will contour targets. So that's going to be the GTV, CTV, PTV, and then some of the higher, I guess, complexity level organs at risk. So brachial plexus is not easy to see. So you do need a lot of experience contouring it. As a dosimetrist, sometimes we are asked to contour it, but most of the time that's going to be something that is contoured by the um, physician. Optic chiasm, again, it looks out sort of in that same gray area where the physician will contour it a lot of the time. The larynx, the pharynx, those are those are organs that are usually extremely close to the target that are dose defining. And we want to make sure that the physician has at least a chance to check it if we do contour it ourselves. The physician should make sure that that is a contour that they want to compromise coverage on or that we want to be using as our dose defining contours because whenever we have like brachial plexus chiasm, they, they are organs where we need to stick to a very specific dose, and that may mean that we have to undercover our target in order to be able to do that. The dosimetrist, we will contour everything else, so any, any other organ that might be in the treatment field, and then we also create planning structures. This is specifically helpful for IMRT and where we will use helping structures to help us uh, shape the dose in the way that we want it or we need it. So contouring, it has to be done with some 
you know, level of care, our doses are going to be shaped based on how we contour or delineate our different organs at risk or even the TTV. The closer that organ is to, to our target, so in this case, like this contour here, then the more dose that they're going to receive. We do want to make sure that we're contouring everything as accurately as possible so that we can get a good representation of how much an organ is receiving. And like I said, we just... <laughs> If you don't contour it, so let's say that in this particular uh, case, you didn't contour the spinal cord, it doesn't mean that we would not be carving out of this area. It would just mean that we don't know exactly whether or not we're under core tolerance. And also, we might not be sparing that area as much as we need to. So where the, some of the higher doses might be conformal to the target, some of the doses that are actually harmful to the cord wouldn't be there. So if we want to see statistics for every organ, it has to be contoured. And if we want to use it for dose defining or for making sure that we're sparing that particular area, again, it has to be contoured. This system will do just about anything you ask it to do, or it will definitely try, but you have to make sure that it's in there um, before the system does take it into account. Okay, so as I was mentioning, the ICRU, we have had different guidelines come through the years, and obviously these are guidelines that have evolved as treatment has evolved. So this ICRU 29 was uh, the first recommendation for what to do, what type of margins to use when we're treating, and how to record dose. And a lot of a lot of the doses were based on point doses rather than overall calculations, again, because we're on 2D era. So we had the one point that we used for calculation, and then we based everything off of that. Then we moved on to ICRU 50. This was a little bit more complex. It did define then volume because we were moving on to the 3D world. And this just helps get everybody on the same page. So making sure that for certain tumors and certain diagnoses, we have certain prescriptions or, and we're recording everything that we do. We have a consistency in the way that we treat. And then we can go ahead and also compare among institutions, colleagues, just or throughout the field, make sure that everything is, everyone is sort of following a similar guideline and what results they are receiving. So then we can utilize this experience of more people rather than just our own. Then here's where we start defining some of the different volumes um, that we use for treatment. So we'll have a different definition for GTV, CTV, PTV. So in here, the very center of this, I guess, picture, <laughs> and this, just, this is an illustration that I, I, everyone probably has already seen at some point or another, even if you didn't know what it meant. So in, at the very center, we would have the GTV, and that is just the actually gross tumor. So anything that has been already identified as actual tumor or a metastasis, that is going to be our GTV. Our CTV is a little bit larger than that, and usually that is an expansion that uh, gets created to encompass also suspected disease. The PTV will usually encompass motion, whether it's internal or some uh, error that is expected during setup. And then we have the volume that was treated as well as the volume that was irradiated, which are not all the same. GTV, just like I was saying, it's the uh, gross demonstrable extent of the uh, disease. So this is going to be tumor that is visible and that can be delineated. And that is usually, if we wanna ever make sure that we are not compromising coverage, the GTV will be it. We wanna make sure GTV, because it is actual tumor, visible tumor, we wanna make sure that that's always covered as best as possible. Just another illustration of how to think about the GTV. And then in actual practice. So here, as you can see, you can actually see the tumor here. So that's what we would contour, our, or not we, but usually the physician will contour as a GTV. And then there are always recommendations. I know RTOG has a lot of recommendations that they give to physicians as well as to on how to best uh, go about contouring. The physician also usually does different imaging. So we would use MRIs for the brain, either T1 or T2, depending on what type of contrast they need to use for visualization.
in other cases, they would use a PET CT, again, just to help visualize where the active disease is. The clinical target volume, this is the GTD with an expansion. This is to cover uh, what is believed to be microscopic spread of the disease. So this is subclinical malignant disease. So there is just an assumption that what we can see of the tumor is not necessarily all, all that exists. So we would usually make an expansion. In the case of this kind of tumor, we can see that there is some irregularity here, at least in this version of the MRI. So that would become part of the CTV. And again, this is just an extension in which we try to cover, you see all of these little tendrils of the tumor that are expanding out, where that's what would CTV's purpose is, is to try to catch the rest of the disease. And there are different guidelines. Like I know, for example, in the brain, depending on which imaging you use, you will see that there is some swelling and some fluid buildup, and that will be the CTV. In the case of the brain, usually the CTV is taken out of the bone because disease will rarely go into the bone unless, you know, it's, it's a very specific type of disease that will go um, into the bone. Most brain tumors will stay confined to the brain. So then you can, you can see how the GTV and the CTV here are pretty much sharing uh, position. And that's just because the tumor is assumed to not go into the bone. So for prostate, our CTV and our GTV are actually the same structure. So the prostate and the seminal vesicles, those are our our GTV and also in practice, our CTV. There is not usually a whole lot of expansion out of it unless it's going into the nose. And at that point, it's a metastasis, not necessarily clinical extent of the disease. So the planning target volume, this is what usually gets prescribed dose most of the time. This is at geometrical extension, then at this point, we are not looking at landmarks within the body, like I said, like the bone in the brain to where limit where the, this target will go into. This is just going to be an expansion. And this expansion usually helps us encompass movement as well as set up uncertainties. So depending on the technique and also the quality of the imaging that is being used, we would have something as small as three millimeter expansion, so it's more common for head and neck tumors, to one, two centimeters, depending on how much motion is expected or the quality of the imaging. And again, here we're just moving outward, so we're just encompassing more of, so we're just getting a larger contour, and that is the case if, for any reason, if you're planning, I don't know if any of you will be involved in any planning, but if our CTV happens to be larger than our PTV at any point, then we probably need to notify the physician and make sure that that is the intent because the CTV should really never be larger than the PTV. Okay, this is just an informational slide. There are different things that would create even replanning. So I know that variations in the CTV can happen throughout the treatment. One of the things that will create a free plan for us or where we need a new plan, weight loss is one of the biggest things. If we have set up devices for a patient and they get damaged or they change throughout the process, we ha may have to do a different scan and verify that we are still treating as intended. So margins, and this is usually for like the internal margin, this is uh, a lot of the time just for the CTV, it can be asymmetrical, like I mentioned before. A lot of it is just to make up for things that we cannot see that some of the imaging will reveal, such as fluid buildup where the disease can be carried in that fluid, or it's some of the things that I am not as familiar with that the physician will know and have guidelines for. Setup margin, this is actually what, this is one thing that will it's very much tied to our therapy team. So the setup uncertainties are things that we can definitely plan for depending on how sensitive the imaging and the machine um, is and the type of setup devices that were used. So a patient that is placed on a back 
uh, backlog bag is expected to move a lot less and have less setup uncertainties versus the basis that is just laying freely on the table. For a head and neck case, if we use a mask, we know that the patient is very much not able to move, which is why a lot of our head and neck tumors only have a, a three millimeter margin for the PTV versus maybe the abdomen where it's a lot harder to vocalize and make sure that there's no movement. Those tumors tend to have a much generous, much more generous PTV margin just because of that. A lot of it's just set up uncertainty. So for the internal target movement, there's the ITV. So the intent of an ITV, and usually this is where we use 4D scanning, sorry, it's to encompass motion throughout the treatment. So for lung cases, very specifically, usually for lung or thoracic cases, we will capture 4D scan. That means that we're going to be capturing 10 CTs, at least that's the way we do it here. There are some that encompass a little less imaging, but it's 10 CTs, that's 10 phases of the breathing. And that is just going to be capturing different portions of our breathing cycle and making sure that all the images in each breathing cycle are been together. And this will help us see any type of motion to see if we need to include it in our CTV. That is why the internal margin can be asymmetrical because movement isn't always going to be in the same direction or in the same quantity in all directions. So here you can see that there is a target that it's very small and we're trying to track it. And this is sort of the movement that is being tracked using the 4D motion. And let me see, let's hope that this works. Looks like it might be working. So in here, this is just a little video to illustrate how the tumor is moving in different directions. And if you can observe this, this is not moving just up and down, it's also moving in a circular motion. So it means it has some anterior and posterior type of movement. So whenever something is moving, we cannot just assume that it's moving in one direction or in, in just one direction. So it usually moves in several directions. And we have to make sure that we're taking all of that into account. So like I mentioned, there is different types of imaging that we can use. So whenever we get a 4D scan and get all of those different faces, there are different sub scans that we can request. So a MIP this is the maximum intensity projection scan. That means that we are going to combine all of the data from all of the scans, and we want to look at the maximum intensity, right? So we're going to look at all the voxels, and whatever voxel did have the most density in it, that's what's going to be represented in that scan. That scan is very frequently used to help us contour, but we have to be mindful that we pay attention where anatomically that is, because if it's too close to, um, like here, it's really close to the diaphragm, it looks like if you look at here, the, this portion of the green contour would have been missed if we hadn't also looked at the 10 faces separately. So always keep that in mind, making sure that we are paying attention to all of our imaging as much as possible. As the symmetrists, we do pay attention to that a lot. We don't contour it ourselves, but we are a second pair of eyes that can help decide whether or not something looks appropriate. Do we have a question? Okay, and I am sure that this is something that might look very familiar to all of you. This is just taking us to the different phases of contouring our targets, going from GTV to CTV, adding internal uh, margin for motion or what have you, and then going and doing setup margins, and then we end up with our PTV at the end. Another thing that we do take into consideration is organs, and then for the organs, there is another volume. It's a planning organ at risk volume, and that is where we're adding some margin to our organs at risk to try to keep them as safe as possible. And, and it just depends on the type of organ that we are trying to spare. And we'll go into more detail in a minute. We have another quest question in the the chat. Is now mm -hmm. an okay time? Yeah. Okay. It, if on my DVH serial organ like spine show on dosimeth on dose statistics shows a max of fifty three gray, but the graph is deeped at forty five gray and with tail con 
continuous with horizontal axis at zero to 53 gray, how would you handle that? I'm not sure if I read that correctly. Okay, so the global or the, the maximum dose to the cord is 53 gray, but the rec or the, I guess the request is 45 gray. That is the cord tolerance. I, got, I went as far as that, and it just says that the deviate curve is flat on the horizontal from 45 to 53. Did I get that correct? I, I think so. Yes. Okay. So, and, and we will get into more detail when it comes to organs at risk here in a moment, but for the court specifically, 45 gray is very much a hard constraint. There are some, I, I think the cervical cord has a little bit of a higher tolerance, but even then, 50 gray is usually our absolute max, unless there is disease that includes the cord or the area around the cord. In that case, we would have limitations and it's still gonna be a very small amount of volume that's allowed to receive that dose, but it has to be disease that actually encompasses the cord or is adjacent to the cord. For everything else, the 45 gray core dose is going to be a fairly strict constraint. Even if the line dose lies flat on the DVH, usually that still means that at least a portion of the cord is receiving that much dose. I know that sometimes instead of using dose max, we can use 0 0.03 cc's and see how much dose that volume is receiving, but it is going to be a lot up to your physician and what protocol they're following. But I know for experience, the cord is one of the things that it's sort of like the holy grail. We do not want to hurt it, especially for a patient that is expected to have a long survival time. We don't want to cause any issues with their spinal cord. So it's still, I would say, try to get that tail to 45. And sometimes that just may mean that you have to go and pay attention where the hot spot is and contour it and then try to lower those just in that specific area instead of trying to put a constraint on the cord, on the full cord. Sometimes it's just concentrating more power onto the very specific area that has the high dose. Because if it's a tail, that means that it's a couple of pixels here or there. Also, pay attention to how you contour your cord. If it's becoming that difficult, you want to make sure that you are also just contouring the true cord and not too much extra margin and get your physician involved. The physician is usually at the end the one that has to make the call. Okay, and so this is just big picture. Now we get to see the DTV, CTV, and CTTV all put together. And for the prostate bed, the same thing. It's just the, the CTV is going to be where the seminal vesicles were. And I guess if you went inferiorly here, you would also see the prostate or the space where the prostate should have been if it, the prostate has been removed. Similar concept, but then we're looking now at a long mediastinum type of case. Okay, so for ICRU 50, we have different definitions of our OAR. So this is actually not current anymore, so this is just here for informational purposes. And you guys, I think, will have access to this slide, so you'll just be able to go ahead and go back and read it if you want to. We actually follow ICRU 62 more now, where we actually are paying attention to serial parallel, serial parallel structures instead of class one, two, or three structures. So this is actually one of the biggest things that we pay attention to a serial structure versus a parallel structure and what that means for us. So for our organs at risk, they all respond a little bit differently to radiation. Some of them uh, heal a little quicker. Some of them require different doses. So for a serial structures, and these are usually our big money structures, so spinal cord, brachial plexus, our brain stem, chia, those are organs that actually do have, they, they, they lose function if we exceed their tolerance in any portion of it. So it doesn't mean that the entire cord has to go to 45 gray, 
that just means that if any part of the core receives 45 gray, we are at increased risk of losing complete function of that organ. For parallel structures, they're a little bit more forgiving. They're usually, they can take higher uh, doses to it as long as there is a percentage of it that doesn't or only a certain percentage that receives the dose. So for example, if we have the lungs, we know that the V20, so this is the volume that is receiving 20 gray is less than 30%. I know for some protocols it's 35. Um, then we should be okay on the lungs. But then there are other metrics, right? So the lungs are a, they're a special type of target because then we also look at the V5, make sure that that's less than 60%. And those are just doses that just from historical data we have seen can have some effect in the way that the lungs function or create side effects such as pneumonitis or radiation induced pneumonitis, right? So yeah, the proximity that the organs have to the targets do increase the complexity of the planning, like we were mentioning before, trying to get the parotids under or to the correct dose and making sure that we are sparing them. It's a lot harder to do with a 3D treatment plan just because it's a lot harder to carve those out. But if, for those cases, even on an IMRC or VMAT case, there's still hard things to do. So like I said, the, the, the closer an organ is to a target, it just, it's going to make your plan harder. We're going to have to then start talking about compromises, whether we need to compromise coverage to the PTV or CTV to spare the organ, or in some cases, if the organ cannot be spare, like if an organ is inside of a CTV, more often than not, the CTV is going to be prioritized. Again, gross tumor volume, that's definitely what we want to treat. And if we're not treating that, then we're sort of counter, it's, it's counterproductive. So th those are conversations that need to happen with the physician fairly early on, especially if the GTV is what overlapping with NERP or OAR. Do we have another question? Yes. So the question we have is, aside from forward planning versus inferred planning, in simple terms, what is the difference between 3D planning and IMRT planning? So <laughs> forward planning means that I get to do everything manually. I get to choose the gantry angles. I get to choose where I block and or if I block the shape of the aperture and Everything that happens in that plan, it's done by me, it's decided by me, and so I am the one that's shaping those doses completely. For IMRT, I am doing the contouring, right, just to get tell the computer where I don't want those, and all I'm doing is giving the system a set of instructions of what I want. And the computer is the one actually figuring out what's the best way to do that. So the, the, the system will verify. Like for VMAT, I don't get to choose my angles other than maybe the size of the arc. If we're going to do a full arc or a partial arc or things like that, there are still some things that you control. But other than telling the system, these are the arcs or these are the beams that we're using, the system will then figure out how much dose is coming through each beam, where the blocks are, and all of the different leaf patterns. So all of that gets chosen, and it's outside of my control. Um, what I control is the instructions that I give the system. So it's forward planning. I control everything. I get to figure everything out for myself. Inverse planning, I give the computer instructions, and the computer gives me the best possible results it can come up with. These are just some examples of the different types of organs that we work, I guess, are, are very commonly our limiting organs. So the spinal cord, this is going to be our number one serial structure. Again, this is just an illustration showing that if we damage any portion of it, if we disconnect, then even if it's whatever portion of the cord is, anything below that is going to be damaged. For the lungs, we don't have a max dose per se that we try to keep out of the lungs, but we do have a series of volumes that need to be kept under certain specific doses that we have discovered through just experience with these organs. The heart, so the heart is a, it's one of our, I guess, it has parallel and serial structures. I know that the coronary arteries are serial, so if any portion of it does get damaged, then the entire thing will fail. Whereas the heart, the myocardium, it is going to be 
a parallel structure. So as long as not too much of it gets damaged, the heart will be okay overall. Another thing is like the heart, usually we want to keep the mean doses fairly low just because we, we obviously don't want to we don't want to risk damaging the heart too much so that it would stop uh, functioning. And then the kidneys, the kidneys, I think they're very, they work a little bit like the heart. For the most part, the kidneys are, they can take a higher dose, but we need to make sure that we are definitely looking at the V to make sure that we're not rendering them non-functional. Because if we do put in too much radiation through the kidneys, they will actually fail. And it is very common, depending on the, the disease that you're treating, for us to focus our efforts into sparing one of them a lot more than the other to make sure that we have one kidney that is as functional as possible. Because just because the kidney will not get damaged and you will not lose function, some of, some of it will be uh, non-functional and that can create problems for the patient still. So ICRU-62 is what introduced, I guess, the PRV. And this is a vol or an expansion that we would create around an organ. So one of the more notorious ones is going to be the cord. Usually there's a five millimeter expansion around the cord and we want to make sure that if the cord is going to 45 gray, then the expansion is, not go is going to no more than 50. And that's just in case that there is any anatomical mismatch at some point that even if the cord moves around a little bit within that volume, that the cord itself is going to get, be getting too much higher dose. So the, the purpose of the PRVs is to make sure that we're not just going to 45 gray to the cord and then two millimeters outside of it, we're going to 60 or 70 gray because if for any reason the cord moves into that space, then the cord would be severely overdosed. I know that for most of our setup instructions or, or tolerances. So we, as a therapist, you will be given setup tolerances, which if the patient is within three millimeters of the, the original position or the, the, I guess, KV images, then usually you are okay to proceed with treatment. And if the cord happens to just be mismatched three millimeters in the incorrect the direction, and then there's too high of a dose there, then we're looking at overdosing the cord. So that's usually why we have a PRV, is to make sure that we are also creating a margin of lower dose around of the organ, just in case the organ does move around a little bit. And it's obviously not always possible, but we do try our best to make sure that we do create a, a more gentle gradient from the cord to the outside of that PRV so that we're not running into too many issues. And then another thing is that the core dose, for example, it's 45 gray, but that's 45 gray for conventionally fractionated treatment. So usually it's two gray per day and no more. If you start going to higher doses, like I know that when, whenever we do three gray or more per day, then the core tolerance actually is 36 gray and then if we're doing a VRT where we're doing 27 grain, three fractions, then the cord has to be less than 20. So the higher the daily dose, the lower the dose that the organs can usually take just because of how much of it gets damaged and how much it can repair itself. So just keep that in mind that some of the uh, more common known constraints for the different organs are based on conventional fractionation treatment. So less than two gray or two gray or less treatment. And if you're doing higher doses than that, make sure that you do consult a table at least to make sure that you're staying within the high air constraints of, that, of those organs. So this is going to be just a prime example of where we would need to undercover the target in order to make sure that we are sparing the cord. So the treated volume, this is just, I guess, the volume that we intended to treat and where we tried to specify those to go into. And it does, it, that's just, I guess what we call it is a treated volume. And this is just, we decide which isodose line uh, we're going to select for that. And that is going to be our treated volume. These are just very general, I guess, terms. They're not super widely used. 
once you're actually in clinical practice, the irradiated volume, anything that receives radiation, it is going to be your irradiated volume. So anything that is in the path of the radiation, whether or not it is high radiation, it is the irradiated volume. So even the low dose staff areas, it's part of your irradiated volume. So this is just showing an evolution of what different levels of contouring we've had to do. So initially it was just target volume, treated volume, irradiated volume. Then we separated the target volume into different portions of it, encompassing the tumor to the tumor plus subclinical disease plus setup uncertainties. And then for ICRE 62, which is our current gold standard, then we added motion into the mix to make sure that we are accounting for motion whenever we're contouring. This is a table that I added for you guys. This is just for reference. It does cover, like I said, conventional fractionation and the different doses that you should probably keep your organs at risk at. And then we're going into one, three, and five fraction as DRT or SRS, sort of giving you some guidelines. It tells you which RTOG protocols it's pulling data from so that if you do have any more questions, you can actually go and reference those particular protocols. So in the notes, you'll see a number here, and that is telling you which RTOG protocol is pulling data from. So I just figured this might be a little bit helpful to you guys. I think Elaine can get in touch with me if you guys just want a specific copy of this. And I think she will may probably give you the slide. So you can have this for reference later. So then we have this. It tells us an ideal picture of what we want, or at least it gives us a general data point that we can use as a guideline. But how do we look at this and how do we read this? So this is the DVH. This is actually, I look at these every day, all day, about 100 times a day, because the DVH is one of the things that is dri drives our planning. Is making sure that we have enough coverage versus enough organ sparing. So in the y-axis here, we're looking at the volume of the different structures, whether it be target or organ. And we're going to look at this either in percentage, if we're looking at relative um, volume, or if we're looking at absolute volume, we're going to look at this in feces. The x-axis corresponds to the dose that is uh, being given, and you can see it in both absolute or relative doses. So for example, here we're looking at the TTV, it looks like 95% of it is going to 25 gray. So I would assume that that is our prescription. Usually that is one of the things that we would look at, at least here at Stanford, 95% of the volume covered by 100% of the prescription. So even if I couldn't see that this was 100%, I would look for that and see if that is correct or indeed our dose to, for this um, particular treatment. And then we would look at different organs. So making sure like this orange contour here is the spinal cord. And it looks like we are about at 10 gray or less. So the cord is definitely well under tolerance. So then we're okay. Again, same principle here, the volume that is receiving at 98% of the prescription. And then the different organs and looking at where they are under those. Okay, so I guess my final remarks, 3D conformal radiotherapy does represent the latest treatment modality in radiotherapy. And just remember that Treatment is evolving all the time. We do get improved efficiency from planning IMRT or VMAT for most cases. There are some cases, like I mentioned, the breast cases where 3D conformal treatment is still our gold standard, just because that is a way that we can limit doses to the, to the heart, to the lungs, and we have figured out a way that we can make that happen without having to have IMRT or VMAT. And we still use it in some cases, but it's, it's rare. So one caveat, so the more and more, I guess, fancy or conformal that we get with our treatment, the, the more that we decrease our, our margin for our PTVs, because that is actually one of the purposes of doing IMRT and more conformal, more well-targeted treatment. But if we don't have or if the tumor is misidentified, 
if the metric parameters are not entering correctly or if the patient positioning is not reproducible, then a lot of what we do with the 3D conformal radiation, so specific, more specifically IMRT or VMAT, is going to actually be rendered useless. So do keep that in mind that the more complex and the more advanced the treatments get, the more careful we have to be during setup as well as during the time that we're contouring and identifying tumors and also the, the parameters that we're entering as the symmetrist to make sure that everything is done correctly. So some take home points, as therapists, you will play a big role in simulation and actually our planning and the quality of our plan very much depend on the setup that we receive. So simulation is always going to play an extremely important role in planning. So communicating often and openly with the symmetry physics physician is key because the more that you can communicate before this can even happen, the better that our setups and everything is going to go from there. So good and accurate contours are crucial. So definitely we want to make sure that we, we are paying attention to the quality of our contours, following all of the guidelines that we you know, find, so ICRU or the protocols from our TOG. Um, and OIR tolerances, they need to be respected as much as possible. There is another thing here, and I did not write it out, but ALERA. So as the symmetries, we are governed by the laws of ALERA. So that's just as slow as reasonable, achievable. So we want to get every organ, even if it's not very close to the target, as slow as we can. One of the reasons is that if we need to come back and treat again, we want to make sure that we have some room for leverage. So we definitely don't uh, want to plan to tolerance on every, to on every organ because then that means that the next time if the patient has a recurrence, they would have a lot harder time getting treated. So just because the core can go to 45 doesn't mean that we should let it go to 45. If we can get it to 30, that means that the next time we can come back and still give it 15 safely. So just keep that in mind always. As you're treating, make sure that you are always looking for ways to reduce dose to all of the organs at risk as much as possible. And then again, treatment technologies that are continuously evolving. We're always seeing something new and upcoming. So for everything, no matter what the technology is, a good setup is key to a successful treatment. So everything ends and everything starts with a good setup. Okay, and this is just a little bit of sort of what we have seen and what is to come. And a little bit of illustration of how we have sort of moved through time from 3D conformal to IMRT to VMA to our passive scatter proton to regular to proton. So this is IMRT, but with protons instead, and then brachytherapy, which is just internal radiation. All right, so I'd like to take these people. They did provide some of these slides for me. And here's a picture of my baby. He is actually scratching at the door, wondering why I'm not letting him in. <laughs> <laughs>